Well, friends, how's it going? How's that chicken parm all right? Is it pretty amazing? I feel like chicken parm should always be a part of the spiritual life. I think it's an important piece uh, to deep prayer <laughs> and belief in God and faith. Every time I taste chicken parm, I always feel like there's got to be a God, right? <laughs> there has to be. Uh, so let's just begin with a prayer. Lord God, we bless and thank you for the gift of this day. May we always give our hearts to you in a new and deeper way each time we wake up and just trust our lives to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, everyone. So today, in the past, I've given talks that have been more, maybe a little more like uh, academic with a lot of quotes and things like that. But I just said, uh, you guys probably get a lot of academics, you know. So I'm just going to share my story about my college life. That's right. I went to college. And guess what? When I was in college, I wasn't a priest. Uh, so it was a riot. I uh, had a lot of fun. Uh, <laughs> had a lot of fun. Uh, just so you know, I didn't know I was going to be a priest in college, so I uh, started praying about it when I was in college, but I didn't really think that was a good idea on God's part. Uh, so that was a joke. You guys are so funny. Um, so here we go. So I, I, uh, in high school, just a little background, high school, I grew up playing hockey. My high school career was basically all focused on hockey. We won two sectional titles, a state title in the highest division in New York State. Uh, first time our school brought, brought home a state title. So my, my focus was very much on kind of like uh, stuff. You know, it was kind of like on hockey, the team, uh, everything that happened around that stuff. Uh, but then I kind of had this strange thing called a conversion where I gave my heart to Jesus at the end of my junior year, which is like a really weird thing to do. Uh, because you never know what's going to happen after that. Uh, so I did this thing, and then I really didn't know anything about my faith, right? So I, I kind of uh, just said yes to God and, and gave my heart to Christ. And, uh, but I, I kind of skipped Sunday school, like every Sunday. And uh, even in preparation for confirmation, I skipped all those classes and was still confirmed somehow, magically. Uh, so here I was going into college, and I'm like, just fresh into this experience of like, yeah, I really want to make faith uh, the center of my life. I want to make God uh, kind of the number one priority in my life. And here I, here I am showing up at Xavier University, uh, you know, s studying who knows what. I started out a classics major, if you can believe it, studying Latin and Greek full time for a year and a half. Uh, then I gave that up after I almost uh, fell off the face of the earth trying to, to learn Latin. Uh, but then I brought myself back to like a pre-law track and, and started studying philosophy, fell in love with philosophy and a majoring philosophy with this kind of pre-law track in mind. But the whole time uh, I was preparing for college, I just said, well, how do I do this? How do I make faith? Uh, the center of my life? How do I put God as the number one priority in my life? How does that, what does that look like? How does that work out? And basically what I did is I stepped onto campus and I said, God, I give you these four years. Again, if you ever like pray sincerely, it's always quite dangerous. Like, you know, thy will be done. Father, bring me uh, to the places and the people you want me to, to be with and, and to be present to. Anytime you pray like that, like it usually happens. And so I step on the canvas. The first thing out of, my, out of my mouth is, God, I give you this four years. I consecrate this time to you. And I don't even know what that means, right? So then I'm kind of exercising this game of patience because I knew a part of, of keeping the faith at the center of my life and, and Jesus is kind of my number one is going to require a support system. It was going to require a group of friends that could support me in my faith and, and, and encourage me to be bold and, and open about my faith and not to just sequester it into like some sort of little part of my life and I only like bring it out for Sundays and other special occasions and I really wanted the faith to kind of consume my life you know kind of kind of bring bring me uh, in, into this deeper relationship with Christ so uh, it took me about a month right I was kind of going in and out of friend groups and I'm kind of like a low-key guy so I just kind of find myself first month like going to different households and groups and things like that and just being like super patient and she be like, Lord, you'll, you'll lead me to the, you'll, you'll let me know when I'm with the people I'm supposed to be with. So eventually a month later, uh, I meet four other students, two girls, two guys, uh, and some are like freshmen, sophomore, one junior. And we start um, talking because we looked at our campus ministry and we said, well, there's a lot offered there in terms of, of service and outreach, which is wonderful. But we were looking for something that was going to help us go deeper in our faith through prayer 
and relationship through prayer and fellowship. And so we, we had some dialogues with campus ministry and they just said, no, that's really not our thing. We're going to focus on kind of the social and outreach aspect. Uh, so then we kind of regrouped a little bit and, and we said, well, maybe we should do something on our own. Maybe we should take the initiative and, and dream up together what we could possibly do on this campus that would provide a need that we perceive as real uh, for ourselves and for other students. And we didn't really know what it was going to look like. So you know what we started doing? We started praying once a week together. What? So like, you know, one guy's a Division I soccer player, one guy's a Division I tennis player. I, I was on the hockey team. Uh, these two girls were like amazing, very popular, right? All these things. So we all had like our own, our own friend groups. But we started to come together once a week kind of quietly and started praying the rosary. What? Who does that? What college students ever prayed the rosary? You know, actually some of you have, but God bless you, whatever. Um, so like this is the idea. It's like we're just gathering for prayer, we're praying the rosary, and we're just like, and we would just like talk after the rosary about like, what is God leading us to do? Like how, like, and we actually started intentionally asking God, like, how are you leading us? What, what would you like us to do, Lord, with this time you've given us in college? And we began to, to pray regularly throughout the year, once a week, and then we started getting together even more than that, started getting some other people that were interested in this idea, but nothing really had come to fruition yet. So f sophomore year, we, we kind of found this group. We, we kind of co-founded this group, and we called it Life After Sunday. Isn't that a riot? Think about that, Life After Sunday, because like Sunday's Mass, and then the rest of the week is not Sunday, so it's Life After Sunday. So like, sorry. Uh, but like this whole idea that that like we, sh we wanted to, to be a group that was going to live our, li our faith boldly after we gathered for, for Mass on Sunday. And so we, we, we kind of get out on, on that tabling day. We're on campus and we're being like crazy Catholics. And we're like, ra you know, f we have like flags and we're handing out like, you know, rosaries and like miraculous medals. Everybody's like, these kids are crazy. But we loved it. We're having fun. And then guess what happened? Like more people kind of gathered around us. And our weekly prayer meeting went from like five to like 20. And then we're praying and we're talking to these groups of kids and we start doing like different events, activities, socials, all this stuff. Uh, by the time I was a senior, we had over 50 active members. We had a Catholic men's house, a Catholic women's house. We had events six nights a week, ranging from, you know, recitation of the rosary to a Bible study to an accountability group to, to small groups, prayer groups, uh, all this stuff, right? And it was all just like, naturally developing. It wasn't anything that we forced. It was just students, again, we, we perceived this need and students saw what was happening and it was basically fellowship, friendship flowing from our communal prayer together. And the more we prayed, the more deeper like friendship we experienced with one another to the point that like I called the guys in my house my brothers. Right? And the, and the women in their, their house called each other sisters. Like, it, and it's not like we were religious, right? I wasn't wearing a habit or anything. But we were just like, you know, being like boldly, boldly Catholic. Like being boldly, boldly Christian. Like just not caring about uh, what people thought of us. But we were just like, this is who we are. But this is the thing, though, is that we, we said we got to maintain those support systems outside of the support system we were creating for the sake of evangelization. Right, so like the guy on the Division One tennis team didn't stop hanging out with his tennis buddies to hang out with us. He was doing both and. Same thing with the guy on the soccer team and myself on the hockey team. Uh, even my junior year, which was kind of like a random story. The team voted me the captain, and I was like, what? I was like, guys, you do all that fun stuff at that fun hockey house, right? And I just kind of showed up and would like wave, and then I'd be like, all right, guys, do what you're going to do. Just stay safe. And then I would like leave. Um, but they were like, no, no, we really want you to, to lead us. And it was just funny that like we all had our own thing we were doing on, uh, in our lives, but we would always come together either at night or on the weekends to support one another in faith. And then what ended up happening is like when we'd go back to our like normal social circles, uh, our usual social circles, we were like one by one, like inviting people in to experience uh, this, this idea of a community of faith that is going after God with all their hearts through prayer, through personal prayer and communal prayer. Oh, sure. Xavier, Jesuit, uh, yeah, Xavier's a Jesuit university, that's right. In terms of undergraduate. About 4,000 undergraduate, that's right. And it's mostly as undergraduates liberal arts. That's right, it's liberal arts, that's correct, yeah. 
Yeah, so it was just like for those four years, just that one prayer I prayed as a freshman, uh, the whole time we were just on fire. We were having way too much fun. Like even at our Catholic men's house, we put it in the middle of the biggest party section of the school. Uh, they didn't allow frats or sororities, but they like, you know, students kind of would create like a kind of a subculture of fraternity and sorority. I'm sure you guys are familiar with this. But we put ourselves right in the middle right in the middle of the biggest party section of school. So like right next to our Catholic men's house was like a four story house of all girls. And I'll never forget the first day we moved into our Catholic men's house. We were like trying to clean out the house, get things ready for the first week of class. Like we just took over the house and we're like re rearranging things and cleaning things up. And then at the door, uh, the girls from next door show up in bikinis right and like beers in their hands and they're like hey we just want to welcome you to the community what's up and like they didn't know what we were right <laughs> so like my buddy's sweeping and i'm like putting stuff in the trash and i'm just like oh my gosh uh and they're like they're like do you want to come outside we have like uh you know we're having a party and it's the beers on us and like you know the they had like a, a kiddie pool outside and they were all in the kiddie pool in the bikinis, whatever. Uh, and, and they're like, oh, you guys want to come out? And my buddy's like, oh, we're busy. We're cleaning up. I'm like, we are? Um, <laughs> but, but like, this is the thing, uh, is that like right away, these households around us are like, who is this group, right? Well, what are they doing? And we started hosting kind of alternative partying. Uh, so instead of like alcohol, we'd serve like, you know, milkshakes. What? And you thought, like, that, is, that can't be possible. Like, how could you become cool? Our house is packed every weekend. Like, you couldn't even move around the first floor of our Catholic men's houses. Of course, it was co-ed, so everybody's moving around. We're partying with, like, milkshakes and, like, you know, and we're doing board games. Like, who does that? It's ridiculous. And we're laughing. We're blasting music. Some of the kids who would, like, come up just to party, right, they just, they didn't know, again, like, the first year they were still figuring us out. So, like, they would just wander into different houses, like, looking to drink and stuff. And they'd wander into our house, and they're like, oh, where's the booze? And you're like, oh, would you like a chocolate milkshake or vanilla milkshake? And they're like, some would leave. Some stayed. They're like, you guys are hilarious. Like, what is this? <laughs> right? So just alternative partying, alternative, just, and what our group became was just creating a subculture within the culture of the university to tell students that here, it's okay to be who you are. Because part of the boldness of our, of our, of our community was the fact that we were creating a space on the university's campus where you could be completely yourself which means also a person of faith. You think, oh, it's a Jesuit university, it's a Catholic university. Like, let me tell you, the dynamics are all, not all that different from here at Colgate. Right? It's still like not cool sometimes to be a person of faith, even at a Catholic school. So like, when we're doing all this stuff, students like felt safe enough to say, I'm, I'm going to be a part of this community. Not all that. I'm just going to go after who God's calling me to be with all my heart. And it's amazing, too, like the joy that kind of like consumed our community in all the right ways, because every time we showed up at like a campus event or whatever, we were just like joy filled and not like bubbly. You know, some like maybe one of my friends was bubbly, but that was just part of her. I'm not talking about a joy that's like bubbly, like, you know, kind of in your face. We were just like truly happy people. And, and the more people saw this joy, the more they were drawn into this community. And, and the more they were drawn into our community, the more they were drawn to prayer and then to Christ. You see, there was nothing, we weren't going out on campus and like, you know, throwing Bibles at people and like, you know, whipping people with rosaries. No, that's just weird, right? Like we weren't like proselytizing. We just showed up and we're like, hey, how are you? And we were offering friendship. Like, we didn't even talk about the faith. The first couple of times we would reach out to students, we would just say, like, hey, what's your name? What's your story? That's awesome. You like that? This is what I do. I play hockey. Like, all this stuff. Like, until they, they're like, well, there's something different about you and this, these people you hang out with. What is it? I'm like, well, if you want to know, coming out to one of our prayer meetings. You see, it's not proselytizing. It's just invitation because people are drawn to this joy. And it became contagious. It's so crazy that... The group still goes today on campus. It's still 100% student-led, fully funded by the university, pushed by the president of the university, saying, if you want to go deep in your faith, go visit life after Sunday. And since that time, right, it's way back when I was a freshman, right, since that time, of the household I lived with, there were three of the guys that were ordained to the priesthood. 
One of the women just took her solemn profession as a religious sister in Chicago. She works on the streets of Chicago as a Franciscan sister, like working with the poor. And then after we graduated, just our first wave, since that time, I think we've had up to five men ordained to the priesthood. And one other woman went to religious life. And it's still going today. And the amount of people that met each other and, and were, felt that call to marriage, right? How many people have like, met each other through our group, through our prayer sessions, through our fellowship time, just fun. Uh, it's amazing that, that just how many vocations continue to come out of this group. Fully led by, by students, right? And, and they, they own it and they're on fire about it, whatever. So that being said, I'm going to share with you some of the spiritual tools that I picked up along the way that helped me through college in a tremendous way. And just, if you're thinking to yourself, like, how do I even do that? What does it even look like? Like, it all start, just starts with the basics, right? Going back to the basics, what's it all about? First of all, you have to find a community. And that community can be as small as two other people, right? Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them, right? That's what Jesus said. So if you just find two other people in your life that you can be real with and you can say I'm going to be so real with them I'm even going to say the word God and Jesus and like bring up the faith and be willing to like ask tough questions and knowing that they're going to receive you where you're at and, and, and they're not going to, you're not going to feel judged right for like tackling these difficult questions find a community and be totally transparent with them right so what do I mean by transparent it means they know everything that, that you think and feel they know, every, they know your whole story. If you can find two other friends that are willing to receive you for who you are, knowing your whole story, and you can be totally open with them, even with some of the weird stuff that goes on in our lives, right? I remember some of my college friends, we would have this thing where we just start sharing sometimes, kind of naturally. And we would share even the weird stuff. We're like, yeah, sometimes, like I found myself in this situation, like I don't know. And they're like, yeah, we should talk about that, <laughs> you know? But like, is there like at least one or two other people in your life that you can just be real with and say like, this is me. At least there's two other people that like fully know me for who I am. And, and it's okay to say like, I want to be a person of faith. I want to be who, I want to pursue my vocation. What is God calling me to be? Who is God calling to be? I want to pursue that with all my heart. And these friends better help you do that. So find a community where you can be totally open, honest, and transparent. And you know that they hold your good in their hearts as if it were your own good. And if you haven't found friends like, like that yet, stay patient, right? Pray for friends. I know it sounds weird. You're like, wow, that's so sad and depressing. No, no, actually pray to God. Be like, help me find the friends that, you, that, that I need. Because they're out there. They're on this campus right now. If you haven't found them yet, it's just you've got to run into them, right? So ask God to lead you to them because these people will help you find not only who God's calling you to be, but to truly find who you are. You know, there's this great reflection in the Catholic tradition that you only really find out who you are by looking into the eyes of another. Only by encountering another who fully accepts and loves you can you really find who you are in the eyes of God. So community. Second is prayer, right? And always attach prayer to fun. So every time we did like the rosary, we'd do root beer floats afterwards. Right? It wasn't just like Rosary and they were like, okay, like, goodbye, God bless you, you know, and, and like we sing like a chant on the way out. No, 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 it's like we would pray the Rosary and then afterwards we would just like be college students and like we'd be hanging out in the chapel steps like for like hours, just like chatting it up, you know, whatever, whatever food item was out. Uh, just always uh, having that community life flow from prayer and that community life leading you back to prayer. In community life, should, there should always be like some serious fun or like some tasty thing at the center of that social life. Uh, so for me, just coming from the Catholic context, uh, the Eucharist was gigantic for me, right? I, I didn't go to, to daily mass ever in my, my young life. And when I got to campus, they had every day a student mass, right? Uh, a mass for students because it was a Jesuit campus. There were Jesuit priests everywhere. And so that every day there was, there was mass offered at 12... 1210. And for the first year, I was like, I'm not going to go. That's just too, that's too weird. Like, who goes to daily mass? And then, you know, sophomore through senior year, I went almost every day. Because once I started to taste, even just once a week, the Eucharist, like outside of the Sunday celebration, it's amazing the amount of strength I received from that gift. It's the amazing, like just the amount of grace packed into that, 
that great gift and, and that, that great prayer with other students, other people my, my age, my peers, who were all like just going to the Lord for strength just to get through this week and, and even just through this day. It's amazing going to the Mass and just hearing the readings, right? Hearing a, a little like homilet, right? It's only like two minute preaching and then you're done, you go on, Mass is what, 22 minutes? You know, we have it here on Wednesdays at 5 o'clock. It's literally like 22 minutes, right? I mean, it's like everyone's like, oh, okay, we just did it. You're like, yeah, you just prayed intensely. You prayed the most important prayer you can pray in your life. Seek out those other opportunities for the Eucharist, for the Mass. Also, Sacrament of Reconciliation. That changed my life, right? I avoided the Sacrament of Reconciliation. You know, when I, when I went, uh, the only time I went as a child was basically my first confession when I was in second grade. Everybody's like, what? Yeah, like that's how like maybe like unculturally Catholic I was because uh, it just wasn't a part of my life. My family was like, yeah, we go to Sunday Mass and that's it, um, which is fine. That was huge. But when I got to campus, I realized that I, I needed like a deeper encounter with the mercy of Jesus. And all of a sudden we, we had confessions offered on a regular basis. And, and my buddies were the ones who were like, dude, you should like try it out. Like you're carrying a lot in your life. And I was like, you're right, I am. And I wouldn't do it. Took me about two years, my sophomore year, I go in and I'm like, all right, I give up. I stop I'm going to stop fighting. I'm going to just say the stuff. I said the stuff. I thought the priest was going to smack me across the face and be like, how could you, you know, I've never heard that sin before. Uh, oh my goodness. Like, I don't even know how you do that. Uh, like, no, no, none of that stuff. It was literally like, uh, yeah, it was an intense moment of mercy where all I heard was, you're loved. Thank you for coming here today. Like, just leave it at the feet of Jesus and just know you're loved. And it was amazing that I started to incorporate the regular uh, sort of exercise of the sacrament where I was going almost on a weekly basis. I know that sounds crazy, but I had a lot to work through in my young life. Just because of my experiences in high school and things like that, there's a lot of things I was still sorting through in my own desires. Right? I realized I wanted God, but there was other things I wanted at the same time. I didn't know how to reconcile that, bring that back together. The regular use of the sacrament was like a gigantic, gigantic help to me and, come, and helped me come to terms with what I really wanted in life, if I really wanted God or not. So those two opportunities for the sacraments. Of course, the rosary. I always say the rosary is amazing because uh, it's like the prayer. Like My mind is always going. You can probably tell us at this point. Like... I have like a million thoughts a day and like when I sit down to pray, especially when I was in college, like it was so hard for me to focus. And the rosary was like such a calming prayer because it, it, it has like this effect of just helping uh, push away all those other voices and thoughts in my life, all those other people that were trying to like vie for my attention. And just for that time, I could find rest in the presence of the Lord because like just the, the repetition of these prayers would help me like come into the presence of Christ where I was totally focused on Him. It's, it's an amazing, amazing gift, especially when you're really worked up. You don't have to do the whole rosary. You can just do one decade, right? Sometimes that's all I would do on a day. But this rosary thing, right, it's a, uh, for, for the Catholic, it, it's a completely Christ-centered prayer, right? It's all about meditating on the mysteries of his life and even the Hail Mary itself, the center of the prayer is, is the name Jesus, right? The Our Father, of course, coming from the scriptures. It's just one of these things that you say, uh, what, what's something I can grab onto in my life? If it isn't the rosary, find something else, right? That you can grab onto your life that really has that calming effect of being like, all right, when I pray this thing, I go to my safe space and, and I can just really, this prayer helps me let go of whatever else is, is vying for my attention. The last thing I want to recommend is silence. Silence, silence, silence. Like in a college career, uh, I have no idea how you figure stuff out, especially with like, your relationship to Jesus and like what's going on in your heart and your mind like without intentional periods of silence. So like in the Catholic tradition there's this great thing called Lexio Divina, it means divine reading uh, and, and monks from going back to the sixth century would, would pray in the style of, of reading the one little gospel passage usually from the daily mass and, and they would uh, just kind of mull it over right and it would just they would just go to silence right so they'd hear the word of god and then they would just sit and and try to receive so do you make s time for silence every day even if it's just 10 minutes you got judge chapel right here you have other spaces on campus like just 10 minutes a day can have a gigantic impact on your relationship with christ 
on your relationship with God. Why? Because when you go to a place of silence, guess who you have to face? First of all, you have to face yourself. It's kind of a scary place sometimes, right? But guess who also waits for you in the silence? Our Lord. Every time you go to that inner room, close the door, uh, that place of what other people could say, oh, that must be so lonely when you go to silence. No, for, in the Catholic tradition, there's this thing uh, where we differentiate between loneliness and, and solitude. And loneliness means you're totally isolated from everybody and everything. Solitude in our tradition means uh, you go alone, you go away to be alone so you can be with him because he waits for you in the silence. How else will he speak, be able to speak to your heart unless you're saying like, all right, Lord, like, I'm not doing anything for the next 10 minutes. I'm not going to pray the rosary. I'm not going to look at anything else, any devotionals, whatever. I'm literally just going to go in your presence and be like, God, this is your time. I'm open. I'm listening. You know, especially in, at Xavier, we started every Thursday uh, from the daily mass at noon to the mass at five. They had three masses a day there every day. Um, we would have Adoration of the Blessed Sacrament all afternoon. And Adoration of the Blessed Sacrament is where they put the host out, you know, and, and you can just go before the Blessed Sacrament and just sit and listen and be silent and just be yourself in the presence of God and let the mask fall, right? It's so important to let the mask fall and just be real in front of God and be like, God, this is what's on my heart today. This is on my heart this week. Like, I'm really struggling. I'm not trusting you. Like, I'm going to bring all my anxieties, my fears to you, and then I'm just going to sit back and be like, I'm, I'm listening. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. So, adoration of the Blessed Sacrament, like just that time for silence, sitting in front of the Lord and saying, like, Lord, I'm open. And then just stop talking. You know, you ever have a friend that, that kind of uh, talks a lot and then you don't really get the chance to have uh, much input yourself? Does it always feel like you guys are, it always feels like you maybe could go deeper, but you can't because they're not really receiving you. Right? Same thing with the Lord. Share what you need to share, and then just stop and say, all right, Lord, now I need to listen. Right? Take that time for silence. Another thing is, uh, sometimes in college, if you say, I want to pursue holiness, I want to pursue God, we can set the bar like super high, right? And then what happens when we fall? We beat ourselves up. We're like, I'm nothing. Like, I don't, you know, I, I don't, why would God even want to pay attention to me now? Like, I know what I want. I know what I wanted to be, and, and, I, and I want to do this for him. And then, like, I chose sin, or I chose something else. Like, Guys, part of the spiritual uh, like, tool that I picked up was learning how to trust in God's mercy with all my heart. So when you set the bar high and you find yourself falling uh, again and again and again, like I did, right? even though I said I want to pursue God, I want to pursue holiness, but I'm, I, I, keep, I keep stumbling, there's an important lesson in that. And the lesson is this. In the spiritual life, and I think in the college life, you have to learn how to fail well. Does that make sense? Like this idea I, I, is I, I, would, I, I need to learn how to fall well, how to fall gracefully, to say when I fall, I have to trust that God's mercy is anticipating each of my falls. His love is anticipating each of my falls. I would also recommend retreats. Has anybody ever been in a retreat? Ever tried it? Uh, it's kind of, it's like, it's amazing, right? If there's ever a retreat opportunity offered here on campus or off campus, whatever, like, in your college career, say, like, let me try at least one retreat in my four years here. It's amazing what God will do with that time. Because when you make time for him, you better believe uh, that he's going to meet you. He's going to meet you right there. Some people think, well, you know, what, what does it really matter? No, no. If you give God a little bit of generosity with your own time, he's going to always outdo you in generosity. So make time for, like, retreat or for reflection days or whatever. Also, spiritual direction. Has anybody ever heard of spiritual direction? Okay. So spiritual direction is when you meet, with like, a priest or a deacon or somebody who's been trained in the spiritual life. Uh, lay people can do this. Anybody can do this. A lot of people grab on to this, this spiritual practice. Why? Because you choose one person. It can be male or female. You can choose one person that you're totally open with about your prayer life. So you meet regularly, maybe it's once a month, maybe it's quarterly, whatever, but you meet and you say, like, this is where I'm, I feel I'm at with God. And here's some things I'm still, like, holding on to and I'm trusting in more than God. Like, I'm still trying to transition through that. Here's some things that happened in my life recently, and I, I don't really understand why they happened. I don't really understand why I reacted this way to this person. And then I took that to prayer, and there was a lot of darkness, like, or, or lack of trust. And, like, just bringing that, 
bringing that to God in front of another person. Say you don't, can't find a spiritual director, what do you do? Find a spiritual companion. It could be another student. I, I did this my first two years at Xavier before I found a spiritual director. My freshman and sophomore year, I had one best friend who knew everything about me spiritually, which means he knew what I was praying about. He knew what I was struggling with. He knew exactly what I was bringing before God in my prayer. Like maybe it's just one friend that you can say, you know what, they want God like I do. So let me start opening up to them about what I pray about and what I bring before God and what I bring before, before the Lord. Uh, so spiritual direction or spiritual companionship can be incredibly helpful. I'd also say pace yourselves. You can't become a saint overnight. I remember one of the greatest frustrations I had in college and a lot of arguments I got in with God was like, why aren't you making me a saint now? You know, because you're like, I, I want this. But then I keep stumbling and I, and I fall and then I get back up and I stumble and fall and get back up and I would get so frustrated with myself and with God because I was like, it's just not, it's not happening yet. Like I know where I need to be and I'm just not getting there. There's a point to that, by the way, is because holiness is God's work in you, right? It's, a, it's not our work, right? It's a gift. God invites us to holiness. God invites us to relationship with him. So like that's a part of the lesson, but I would say pace yourself, be kind to yourself. Right? Like, college can be, like, kind of a crazy time sometimes. Everybody agree with that? Like, when I was in college, sometimes I found myself doing things. I was like, oh, whoa, whoa, <laughs> okay. Like, didn't, didn't, didn't know I'd be a part of that activity today. Uh, but that's just a part of the college life, right? Hey, you're getting in the back. You're loving it. Um, but no, like, they're, they're, that's a real thing. Like, so, like, there's, an, there's this idea that, like, and, and part of trusting God's mercy is to say, like, hey, like, I'm a human being. So if I find myself in a situation that I wasn't, like, not, I'm not proud of or what, wasn't planning. And, like, for goodness sake, just be kind to yourself. Be like, all right, like, listen, get up. Get up the next day with fresh eyes and, and, and just know you're starting a, a new day. You can't become a saint overnight. What do you do when there's challenges in the classroom to faith? Anybody ever been challenged in the classroom because you're a person of, of faith, a person of belief? Even at a Jesuit university, a Catholic university, I was challenged in the classroom by professors for being a person of faith. And, and basically what it came down to was like, oh, you're one of those. Like, how could you? Like, what about like, you know, just in a very primitive way? Like, what about science and all? It's like, yeah, absolutely. Like, I'm not, you know, holding to certain, certain theories that are just kind of off the wall. All I was doing was saying, like, can I speak about this topic from a perspective of faith? in an academic setting. And, and sometimes I even got uh, slammed down for trying to do that. So what do you do when you feel those challenges in the classroom? I would say this. So usually the challenge comes uh, kind of like in this form, at least it did for me, is I would leave the class and I would just be overcome by doubt about my faith, about the reality of God, about whatever. So what do you do with doubt? Here's my one encouragement for you. Don't let it disturb you. There is such a thing as healthy doubt. Right? So if something's challenging in the classroom and, and you're trying to, to wrestle with something intellectually, especially if it's a theological premise or an anthropological premise, like when you're going through doubt, it's okay. Because in our tradition, especially St. Anselm, he talks about faith seeking understanding. So the only way you can come to deeper faith is by going through a period of doubt. But what it requires from you and it required from me was to do self-study. So if you're like, oh, I'm, I'm unclear about this, about Catholic theology or, 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 you know, Christian teaching or, you know, what the scriptures actually say about this or, you know, what, what scholars say about this scriptural passage within theological circles, like, for goodness sake, just do some self-study. It's amazing how much self-study in my own time helped me come to a deeper faith. Because I'd be hit with these very difficult questions. And then I would say, you know what? I need to spend time. And that was part of the, the strength of the community I was finding myself in is we push each other to go deeper and deeper in our understanding of, of the faith. Uh, last thing I would just say about evangelization. So there's a difference, again, between proselytizing and evangelization. Proselytizing is where, like, convert or die, right? And evangelization is like, let me invite you to the beauty, to, to look at the beauty of the gospel, the beauty of the faith. It's so important that when you're creating social circles, like a subculture of faith within the culture of the campus, not to circle the wagons and no longer interact with your other typical social circles. Does this make sense? 
right? Because how else will you invite people to the, to, to the good news if you cut yourself off from people that you would say, well, this isn't a, these, these aren't people of faith, or this, you know, this fraternity or sorority is not helping me with faith. No, like, still stay a part of those circles. That's the importance of the subculture, the, the community that can support you in faith. It's so you can take the good news back to these social circles that, in God's providence, God has brought you to these people. People that are people of faith and people that aren't people of faith. Like, God has brought them into your lives to teach you a lesson. And he's also brought you into their lives so you could maybe invite them to the, to the good news of the gospel. Uh, so keeping those social networks are, are so important. Also, compassionate hearts, right? Always meet your peer, your fellow student, with a compassionate heart. Meet them where they're at. Don't look at them and be like, oh, well, I live my life this way. Like, you should be there too. No, no, like, just meet them where they're at. Accept them and love them uh, with this culture of kind of openness and, and dialogue. Don't be afraid. And I'll leave you with this today. Don't be afraid to enter into real debate and dialogue. And again, you're not here to win the argument, right? You're not here to win, right? If truth is truth, it'll speak for itself, right? Ain't that the truth? I love that. Um, but if, if we're all seeking the truth, then you don't have to win. If we're all seeking truth with sincere hearts, then the truth will speak for itself. So do not be afraid to enter into debate or dialogue, always with a compassionate and loving heart, and do not be afraid when you don't know the answer. You ever get caught in this, like in the classroom, maybe outside the classroom, somebody's like, oh, you're a person of faith, like, what about your position on this? Or what about, like, try to explain this thing? A and you can't. Don't try to, like, over-explain to the point where they're like, oh, you don't even know what you're talking about. Just be like, oh, I don't know. Let me get back to you on that. I'm going to do some self-study. I'm going to do some prayer and reflection on it. Again, you're not here to win. Creating a culture where people feel safe, where they feel accepted, but also where you can actually enter into sincere and transparent dialogue where you can even offer some challenges to say, now I'm going to challenge you a little bit to say, like, have you ever thought about this? Have you ever thought about this perspective? So those are kind of some of the spiritual tools I picked up in my toolkit. Hopefully one or two things are applicable in your own life. Uh, it was a joy to share with you my story, especially my own college career. Uh, but I, I just pray and hope that even if you just take one step in many of these in, you know, steps that I've kind of offered today, it can make a world of difference in your experience, not only of, of your time in college, but also your experience of God and your faith. So I'm going to stop there. Sorry about that. <laughs>